Hello, welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for quite some time now, and uh, I want to start off by saying I'm really grateful that you've decided to spend this time for me and joining me on this conversation of happiness and education. Um, this is something I'm really passionate about, and I'm not up on this stage because I think it's easy to be happy in education. I'm up on this stage because it's actually something I've struggled with, and I've struggled with it several times in my career. And so I'm up on this stage really as part of my journey. And part of that journey is I've learned some important things, I think. And I want to share those with you. And it, it really comes down to the fact that I'm really optimistic about that happiness in education is entirely possible. But my biggest learning is that we have more control over it than we think. And I want to share what I've learned with you. So I want to do that by starting off and asking you this question. How happy are you as an educator? Now to do that, I want you to quantify it. I want you to give it a number between zero and 10. Now this is relatively difficult to do, so I'm gonna give you some assistance. If you are a zero, you would be like Jerry Maguire. So if you're currently writing your manifesto, give yourself a zero. Now, if you're like Agnes, she was a teacher in the United States. She taught actively in the classroom till 102 years of, um, of age, and she did it because she loved it so much. So she would be your 10. So on this number line, where would you fall? I'm going to share my number with you. So my number currently is an 8, and I'm excited to be an 8, and it's something that I've worked really hard to achieve. But it's not really the 8 that's important. It's how I got to the 8, and I want to share a bit of this journey with you. And when I do workshops on happiness and education, I often do this thing called the happiness timeline. And it's basically, you graph your happiness over the course of your career. And I find it's a great way to reflect. So if you look at my timeline, you're going to say like, whoa, that's <laughs> some highs and lows on that. And I want to tell you why that's important and what I've learned from this. I read this really great book one time called Peaks and Valleys by Spencer Johnson. And in this book, he talks about how we all strive to be on the peak, but it's the valleys that are also very important. And it's in those valleys that we learn these crucial lessons that allow us to get back to peak. So I want to talk to you a bit about some of the valleys I've been in and some of the lessons I've learned. So as you can see, when I came into education, it was amazing. It was some of the best years of my life. And when I reflect on why it was the best years of my life, it's because I was constantly learning. I was so excited to go into school every day, learning about students, learning about pedagogy, learning about classroom management. And really, it was like, it was energizing. So then I came up with this amazing idea is you know what I need to do? I need to get into a really good school, I need to get a straight grade, and then I need to start designing my units and lessons so I have them, all that kind of pedagogy planning piece out of the way and then I can just enjoy teaching. Well, it's actually led me into my first valley. So this valley was created for the, the fact that I kind of stopped learning and stopped growing and I wanted just to coast a little bit. And um, all of a sudden, teaching wasn't as exciting. It was a little bit more monotonous. And I, you know, at the time, I couldn't figure it out. Well, fortunately for me, you'll see a little peak after that as I met some incredibly inspiring educators. And I had the opportunity to work with them. And they really inspired me to make some changes in what I'm doing, to step out of my comfort zone. And when I did, I experienced some growth. Now, you're probably all wondering what this one's about, because it's a pretty deep valley. So that was kind of happened for two reasons. One was partially life. My amazing wife and I decided to have a family. And through both pregnancies, she became really sick. She had hyperemesis. That's what Princess Kate had. And she had morning sickness for all nine months. And you know, between not sleeping and, and watching her suffer like that, it was a really tough years. But I want to tell you that it was really some of the best years of my life as well. Not because my wife was suffering. Um, <laughs> but what was going on professionally was this is my administration at the time wanted me to make changes to my schedule, and I was unwilling. I was absolutely unwilling. I felt very entitled of the classes I was teaching and the subjects I was teaching. And this led to conflict that kind of brewed into something worse and worse and worse to the point I got to this bottom of this valley. And I want to share this moment, and it's something I'm almost embarrassed about to share, but I want to share what happened. I was put on the administrative transfer list to be moved to another school because of this. And it was... Um, it was a really tough moment for me, and I remember they shut the door, and my superintendent was on the way to do this to me, and I remember thinking, fine, move me wherever you're going to move me. I'm just going to shut it down and count my days to retirement. I'm done. And I remember this feeling of, like, that is not what I got into education to do. I did not 
do this. I came to be fulfilled. I came to make an impact. I am not doing that. So in this valley, I learned a crucial lesson that it's important to be willing to change. Now, fortunately for me, my administration was amazing. We were able to work things out. They gave me even leadership within the school, and I was able to get out of that valley. So fast forward a little bit, and then I'm back to being really happy in education. And uh, so much so that I was presenting on happiness in education um, at a conference at Connect last year. And if you were to ask me then, I would have told you, I'm pretty much set. I was really optimistic that I'm not going to have any more valleys. I'm just going to keep enjoying more and more and more. Little did I know, I ended up in another valley about three months later. And I want to tell you the lesson I learned in this valley. And I am super grateful for this valley because it taught me something that's going to help me in every dimension of my life. So, and it, I think with the learning in there is really important too because I've been able to get out of valleys quicker since I've done that. And that's what's putting me on the stage today. And I am actually happier than I was last year. So let me tell you about the lesson I learned. So I was really struggling with some stuff. And um, my wife says to me, she'd read this book called Before Happiness by Sean Aker. And I love Sean Aker's writing, so I decided to read it. And in the introduction, he talks about this. He talks about how subjective realities are. And I was like, I never really thought of reality as being subjective. I never thought of it as something I created. I just thought of it as like what I was dealing with. Well, here's the deal. I created a negative reality, and I was using everything in my power to support that negative reality. And it just wasn't beneficial. And he goes on in this book to talk about how really happy and successful people can see multiple realities of the same situation, and they choose the one that has the most value to them. So I remember thinking about this before I went to bed. And the next morning, I got up, and I looked out my window like I do every day, and I had this complete flush of gratitude. And, you know, for three months prior to, I couldn't see anything positive. I was in this really bad state. I was really aggressive. I was really angry. I was really toxic. And I just wasn't happy. And that morning, for some reason, I saw everything through a different lens. I was able to see all the great things that were happening in my life. And it was a really powerful moment to me. If I could put it into analogy, it would go like this. It's like the idea of when we get glasses and you know you walk and if you don't if your visions become impaired somehow and then when you put on glasses and they really work it's like seeing that world through this new lens and you're seeing it clear and you're seeing it way better than it was. I want to use this idea of the process of getting glasses and tie it into the idea of happiness and education. So just bear with me this will be pretty abstract but I'll pull it together. So let's think about when you when you get glasses what do you do? You something causes you to go to the eye doctors, right? So whether you get a ch card in the mail that's a check-in, whether you are starting to get headaches, whether you're having trouble reading because it's getting blurry, something gets you there. And when you get there, they put you in front of this machine called a ferropeter. And the eye doctor, when you're in front of the ferropeter, shows you an image and it's unclear. And what he does is he switches through a variety of lenses and asks you if it's getting better or worse. And as those lenses flip through, it begins to get clearer and clearer and clearer until you see what you're supposed to see. Now, I, I can see some of you squinting at this if you're trying to figure out what it says. It says, teaching is the best career if you can see it that way. And I believe that is really important. So let me tie this together for you, though. So the process of getting glasses and the process of being happy in education, I think it starts with awareness. So why I asked you to quantify your happiness and why I think the happiness timeline is important is because I think it's important that we think about this. Just like when your eyesight's deteriorating, deteriorating over time, you don't often know it till you sit in front of the ferropeter machine. And I think the same can happy with, happen with happiness in education. You know, it can, it can go down slowly over time because we're not stopping and paying attention to it and thinking about it. We need to have check-ins. We need to ask ourselves, how happy am I? And if the answer isn't what we want, we need to make those adjustments. We need to say, and is this getting better or worse as we make those adjustments? And if we do that, we can come out with a prescription. Now, I would love nothing more to stand on this stage and tell you that this is how you're going to be happy in education, but that's not possible. Because being happy in education is like finding the right pair of glasses. It's unique to you. And so, when doing this, I think it's all about your journey and it's all about looking at yourself and finding out what works for you. And so today, 
is about a couple of things for me. It's about getting you to be aware of where you're at, getting you to think about this, um, like getting you to think about, you know, your happiness levels and how they're impacting you and adjustments you need to make. And I'm going to try and give you some ideas on where to start. And then from there, it's up to you. And why I think perception and how we see the world is so important is because it informs our beliefs. And our beliefs are really what make us powerful in terms of in education, in terms of life, and in terms of happiness. That's what, it, it, really, it really kind of promotes that. So let's put a belief statement up right now. And I want you to think about this. And I want you to think of it, do you agree, strongly disagree? Um, so we'll th show you the statement. The statement is this. I believe that I have the power to make a difference in every student's life that I teach. Do you believe that? I really want to emphasize the word every. As an educator, do you believe that you can impact every student you teach in a positive way? Now what I want you to think about is how that will impact how you do your job. If you really believe that you can help every student, think how much further you're going to go. Think how much more perseverance you're going to have. Think of how you're going to go that extra mile for that student and you're going to be the one that changes their lives. Now, if you don't believe that, you might quit just a little too early and not be the person that changes that student's life in the most positive way possible. I want you to think of this belief statement. I believe that I can be happy throughout my entire year as an as, uh, my entire career as a teacher. You need to believe it if you want it to happen, right? If you don't believe it, you know, a lot of people in education, it's sad, do not have that belief, and it really impacts the enjoyment they get out of their career. We need to learn how to believe that this is possible. I'm going to tell you where I started to believe it. Um, this teacher right here is Wendy Belinsky, and for me it was seeing was believing. You know, I work with a lot of teachers, and when I met Wendy, I worked with her for about an hour. And um, Wendy had been teaching for 28 years at that time, and I left there so inspired. Inspired by the way she interacted with her students, inspired by her level of passion in terms of moving forward in technology, just her overall joy of being in the classroom. And I was like, I remember driving out of the parking lot and being like, that right there is what I want to be. 28 years in, that's what I want to be. And you know, it really started me thinking, and I would say that it's what planted the seed that put me on this stage today, was meeting Wendy. And I became more aware of this, and I started to look around more, and I started to notice there's tons of educators that are able to do this, so why can't I? I want to just highlight a couple of them. This is John Haney. Um, what an inspiring educator. He's been in our system for 50 years as a teacher. He actually taught me in grade six. And uh, just to give you an idea of this man, is currently he's fighting cancer. Yet he still wakes up at 5 in the morning, still goes to the gym. Then he goes and does elementary gymnastics at 6.30. And then he runs our entire athletic program for the board. And I, when I ask him why he does it, it's because he loves it. And I find that very inspiring. This is one of my newest friends. I've picked her up in the last couple of years. Well, not picked her up, but I've, uh, <laughs> I've, I've, I've brought her into my circle. And um, I Linda Chown, and we worked on this Harriet Matters project together. And uh, inspiring, passionate, and seeing what she can do with kids and bringing the Harriet Tubman legacy to life in Niagara, mind-blowing stuff. And I just look at these type of educators and I think, that's where I got to get to. And I think it's not necessarily seeing, believing is the most important part. It's believing is seeing. You need to believe it is possible if you want to see it happen. And I think that's a crucial lesson that I'm learning. So why happiness, right? People are always like, why are you the happiness and education guy? Where'd that come from? Well, it started off when I met with Wendy. I was actually really intrigued by her level of motivation. And I was like, how do I be that motivated at the end of my career? And then I started to read about motivation and get really into it. And then I took a pivot somewhere, and I don't even know where it happened. And all of a sudden, I was reading about positive psychology and happiness. And I realized that it wasn't Wendy, John, or Linda's motivation that was really intriguing me. It was how happy they were. And I thought, that's what we deserve as teachers. We deserve to be happy. So I began to do some research, and I'll show you some really interesting facts on this. So Harvard came up with this study, and they said happy people are 37, 31% more productive. Can you imagine being 31% more productive? How much more you would get done? How great that would feel? 
You know, often we see these teachers walking around and you say, how do they do everything they're doing? Maybe they've tapped into this level of passion which makes them that much more productive. What about 37% higher in sales? When I see higher in sales, I relate that in education to student buy-in. Imagine as a teacher, you could have 37% more student buy-in. How great would it be to teach that class? And how much impact would you have? And the other stat was three times more creative. If you were three times more creative, how fun would your lessons be to teach? And how fun would it be for a student to come into your class? Think of that and how much of an impact that could have in what you do. Sean Acor has this really interesting book called Happiness Advantage, and he talks about, you know, this process of achieving happiness, and he tells in the book that we have the wrong way, we're going the wrong way about it. We kind of teach people that we work hard, if we work hard, we achieve success, and when we achieve success, we will find happiness. We will have what we want and be able to do what we want and go where we want. And he says this is not true, and I, I, if you sit there and think about it, you think of how many people work really hard and achieve success but have no happiness in their life. It's common. Instead, if you reprioritize and you say, well, I'm going to be happy, I'm going to work on my happiness, because if you work on your happiness, then you might find something you're really passionate about, and when you're really passionate about something, you're going to work harder because you love to do it, and when you work harder, all of a sudden, you're going to have this level of success, but it's a different success. It's a success that involves fulfillment, happiness, being engaged in what you do every day. So I want to show you one of the most powerful pieces of research I believe in positive psychology. They say that 50% of your happiness comes from your genetics. Now I know some of you guys are like, oh geez, thinking your parents and going, this is a nightmare. Um, but it gets better, don't worry. 10% comes from circumstances. Only 10% of your happiness is controlled by what happens to you. I think that's powerful. And I think what's even more powerful is that 40% is stuff that's in your control. It's the lenses you look through. The, the, that it's the lenses you look through. It's the decisions you make. You know, it's the people you surround yourself with. We have a lot of control over our happiness. And when I see 40%, I think to myself, I want to get as much of that 40% as possible because that's what's going to make my life awesome. So I found this word that I really like for multiple reasons, and it's strive. And the reason why I like strive is because the definition is make great efforts to achieve. And I think, what is more important than working hard towards achieving happiness? You know, it really, everything we do really boils down to us trying to be happy. So why don't we actually work towards that? The other two reasons I like strive is because it forms into a really sweet acronym. Uh, I did acrostic poems in grade five with Miss Morrison. Never knew I would ever use one in my life, but she'd be crying if she saw this right now. I remember Remembrance Day. So, but why I like strive the most is this. It starts with S. So you're like, why is that a big deal? Because it means students to me. And in education, students always have to come first. No matter what we're doing, even if we're looking at happiness, students have to be at the forefront of what we do at all times. And I'll take through the letters. T is for team, R is for routines, I is for innovate, V is for versatility, and E is for extraordinary. So I'm just gonna spend the next little while going through these and giving you some ideas in each of these categories. So let's start with students. And why are students so important? There's a million answers, but I think one of the best things students do for, for us in terms of our jobs is they give us meaning. You know, people who really look for um, happiness and what they do in employment, one of the biggest things they're looking for is something that has meaning or they have a purpose. And so I think when I look at this and when I talk to teachers and interview teachers on happiness in education, it's very interesting. They're, they almost like are hyper-focused on students. They almost have like blinders on and they use those blinders to block out all of the things that will take away from their happiness. It's, it, it's really interesting. Now, as I do, I'm going to leave this idea and come back to it later, because I think that's fun. And I'm going to talk to you about an island called Okinawa in Japan. Now, this island has some really interesting things about it. The most interesting things are this. It had the highest life expectancy of anywhere in the world for decades in a row. It had the most centurions, people over the age of 100, for years in a row. Here's some side facts that have nothing to do with happiness. It's actually where karate came from, but the best one, it is the home of Mr. Miyagi's dad. 
How awesome is that? Um, but here's what I like most about it, and here's how it ties into happiness. They have this concept called ikigai, and ikigai's translation is reason for being. See, they're not about work. They're about finding your reason for being. And I think that's really powerful. They're so about this that in their um, vocabulary, they, vocabulary, they don't even have a word for retirement. It's not even part of their culture because they think you would never quit your reason for being. And so how this ties into education is this, is when you look at the four categories, right, and I'll just go through them, it's what the world needs, what you can be paid for, what you are good at, and what you love. Now, being an optimist, I look at that and I think, wow, we're halfway there in education. We're getting paid to do this, and we're doing what the world needs, and I would argue that we're probably doing what the world needs the most. So now we just got to figure out it, what it is you love to do and how you get good at it. And I think that's what today's about, right? How do you maintain that love of it, right? And when you look at Ikigai in the center, and, and I think of teachers who really love education, I think their Ikigai is students. Students are their reason for being. And they're very good at keeping a focus on that. It's kind of like Simon Sinek's big talk on the why. He talks about the golden rule and keeping your why at the center of what you do. I'll tell you something powerful I've seen about the why lately. Um, I'm part of this team that runs this Growing in Your Teaching Career program, and teachers come in, and we do this part on the why and connecting t teachers to the why. So at the program, we ask teachers to stand up and said, what had one of the greatest impacts with you? And a lot of teachers will stand up and say, it was reconnecting to my why. I lost that somewhere along the line. I don't even know where I lost it. I became so what focused. What am I teaching? What expectations? What technology am I using? And it was what, 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 what. Instead of being about the why, and just by thinking about their why and refocusing it on their why, they began to be inspired again. I'm going to show you a really cool video. This is Barry White Jr. out of North Carolina. And every day he starts his class with these handshakes. And now he's doing it with the whole school. But when you look at what he's doing, is he's giving really cool handshakes, right? But if you listen to Barry talk, his why is very interesting. His why is that he wants to change these students' lives. His why is driving him. And when you talk to him about his how, his how is doing it through building relationships, establishing trust, and making school and engaging for students to come into. So I think it's really powerful when you start with your why. And then when he gets to Barry's what, what is he doing? He's giving handshakes, and he's probably got a hundred other great things he's doing, but it all stems from his why. The T in STRIVE stands for team, and I love this quote. It says, teamwork makes the dream work. And what is the dream in education? The dream is to work for 30 years, love what you're doing, and make an incredible impact. But in order to succeed in this, you are going to need to surround yourself with the team that's going to help you get there some really, really powerful research around relationships. So in this first one, the longest study on wellness, it's currently over 80 years right now, they've come out with one conclusive thing. They've been able to tag down one conclusive thing, and this is it. Listen, and this is their quote. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. Period. It's all about relationships. Here's another one. They took a study of like 60, they, they, they looked at 1,600 people and they were able to isolate the top 10 happiest people in that group. And then they, what they did is they looked for a common thread that interwove them all. They only found one. And that one thing they found was the strength of their social relationships. Here's another one. This is Susan Pinker, and she has a TED Talk called The Secret of Living Longer, in which they looked at this island called Sardinia, and they had this abnormal amount of people who were living past the age of 100, and they analyzed these people's lives. And look at the stats up there. The top two are relationships. Above quitting smoking, quitting drinking, exercise, vaccines, you name it, relationships trumped all of them. I think that's powerful. So I have this idea in this way in my head, I always think of my TFS, right? And it's, I'm, I get emotional because I look out and I see a bunch of them here today. And um, I think this is really important in education, is surrounding yourself with the people that are going to help you get where you need to go. And, you know, I think there's two parts to this. It's drawing them to you and being able to recognize that they're going to have a really positive influence in my career. They're going to be really 
interesting and push me and fun and keep me young in the profession. And then I think the next one is this, is not just bring them into your circle, but how do you keep them in your circle? And how much of a priority is it to, for you to make them stay there? You know, sometimes we leave schools and go to another school and sometimes we just lose track of people. But if they're truly important, bring them with you, connect with them all the time. These people will be there when you need them the most. The other way is I really have, in the last couple of years, I've really become excited about is PLNs, or personal learning networks. So if you don't know what these are, is people basically create informal PD for themselves, and a lot of time they're using technology. So they go onto Twitter, and they follow people that they, you know, re that really inspire them, that they can learn from, that have shared interests, and they almost create their own PD circle. I was presenting at the Ontario Summit. I did a workshop on happiness and education there. And before I went in, I was sitting at this table of educators, and they looked like they were all best friends, like TFFs. Like I just landed at the TFF table. I was like the total outlier. And then I'm watching them, and I'm listening to them, and I realized they've never even met before. They were PLN friends. They'd met through Twitter, and this was the first time they got together. And I thought, how powerful is that, that we have control over our own PD if we want to? And so if you haven't tried things like Twitter and, and creating a PLN, it's a really powerful way to keep yourself happy and motivated. I came up with this idea about two years ago called Random Acts of Recognition. And how I came to it, it's like a spin off of Random Acts of Kindness, but I was trying Random Acts of Kindness, and I really loved it. When I was able to execute, it was awesome, but I found I had a very low completion rate. I'd get these really positive ideas about someone, and then I'd say, well, I want to go out and do that, and then life would interfere with that, and I would never actually get it done. And so, I came up with this idea of, well, it doesn't have to be a random act of kindness. What if I just recognized it? And so what I changed is I all of a sudden started to act on positive thoughts I had about people. I put them into action immediately. So what it would look like is I would be sitting on my couch at home and say I met someone really inspiring or had a great conversation and I thought about it. I would just go, I need to put that into action. And I just pick up my phone, I do it using technology, and I just send them a text. I'd send them an email, I'd give them a shout out on Twitter, however we communicate, I would do that. It doesn't have to be technology, you can write them a note, make them a card, put it in the mail. But acting on those moments is powerful. And I th why I think it's really powerful is when we think back to our TFFs and those relationships, is it helps you build really strong relationships. But what I've begun to realize, and I didn't even realize this at the time when I was doing it, was it began to establish new great relationships that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to have before. So here's a challenge to you. If you get really inspired by someone, or you have a really authentic, positive thought about someone, put it into action. And send something, and, and I want you to reflect on how it makes you feel. And I want you to think about the impact it has on that other person, and I want you to think about the impact it has on those relationships. Because relationships are everything in education. So the R in STRIVE stands for routines, and just like random act of recognition is the routine I built into my day, I think there's a lot of areas to build routines into our um, daily workings and teaching that could really lead to a lot of happiness. You know, when you look at these blue zones, so I've already talked about two blue zones, so Okinawa and Sardinia, they're two of the five blue zones in the world, and these places are the, where the oldest, happiest, and healthiest people live. And they really analyze these cultures, and I read this, blue, this uh, book called Blue Zones, of happiness and the one thing I pulled out of it that I thought was really interesting is that these cultures have what they call nudges that nudge people into being happier nudge people into being healthier so I'm going to talk to you about you know happiness routines and think to yourself like how could you nudge yourself into doing these things that are going to bring a lot of fulfillment to your career so I made this infographic and there's six areas to this and as I go through these six areas I just want you to reflect and think to yourself where could I build this into my day so let's start with self-care. Self-care is so important. It's really hard to take care of other people if you can't take care of yourself and if you're struggling with that, right? Uh, we were at that Growing In Your Teaching career one day and they had a social worker come in and talk about self-care. So at the end of that, I went up to the participants in the program and I was asking them questions like, what did you think of that? And they said two things really came out. They said, we really needed that. We really needed that reminder to take care of ourselves. He was talking about things like sleep, unplugging, exercise, things we know, but things we need to be reminded of. But the most powerful thing I kept hearing over and over again was that we needed permission. As teachers, we need to give ourselves permission to take care of ourselves. 
And we need to give ourselves permission with the understanding that it's going to make us better at what we do. The next one is mindfulness and gratitude. I think it's really important to be present and to be mindful. And I'll show you a stat that blew me away. We spend 47% of our day distracted. So while we're doing something, we're thinking of something else. In the book, 10% Happier by Dan Harris, he kind of makes an analogy to when we're eating food. You know, we put it in our mouths and we're not even enjoying it before we think of our next bite. I know I do that all the time. And I think it's important that we slow down a little bit and we take the time to really enjoy life and be present in that moment. And as a nudge, I think we need to build this into our lessons, right? I think when, in terms of if we build it into what we do, so if we're working on kind, or we're working on like gratitude in the classroom or being really present by having them doing breathing exercises or gratitude journals, it kind of puts it in the forefront of our brain and we're actually achieving that as well. And I also think we can do it through physical reminders. And what I mean by that is everywhere I go, I carry this stone. And this stone for me is a reminder that I need to be present and grateful in what's happening in my life. And it's interesting, I'll just be talking to someone, put my hand in my pocket, and then I'm queued up to be there. And I think there's many different ways we can do this. It doesn't have to be a stone in the pocket. It could be a special watch you're wearing or a necklace. You can even tie it into things like writing your why on your day book or writing something that, a quote that forces you to be mindful in the moment when you're doing your lesson plans. Or um, the latest one that I did is I made my password that I log into computers with something that inspires me and kind of keeps me on track. And I'm doing this all day, every day, and they're like nudging me to be happier all the time. Number three is positive intake. And I would say in the last three years, this is what I've been able to take most control of. You know, I'll use media for example. We're inundated with negative media all the time. Think of how media has changed. When we were younger, you know, we would have the news from 6 to 6.30 and that was it. Think of what it looks like right now. From the minute you wake up, to the minute you go to bed, you are inundated with news and media from social media to 24-hour news stations to radio stations. It's coming at us all the time. And I think it's really important we look at what that media is doing to us. And this research on the media is, is bad because it, the, the media is showing us an unrealistic ratio of good to bad in the world. They're showing us 95% of what's bad in the world and 5% which is good. And what that's doing is training our brains to pick out these negatives. We need to train our brain to pick up the positives. I think it all starts with a healthy morning routine. I, I read this study that said they, show, they, they replace three minutes of negative media in the morning with three minutes of positive media, and the participants recorded, on average, 27% more happiness six to eight hours later. Six to eight hours later, they were that much more happier. It's powerful. So I think in, in terms of what we're doing, we need to think about this. One thing that I really enjoy is as I've created playlists, I have a playlist for gratitude, I have a playlist for motivation, just one for fun. And I do that because I'm, at this, I'm blocking out negative media while at the same time I'm filling my tank and becoming inspired. And I think there's a lot of ways to do this with media. You can watch TED Talks, audiobooks, podcasts. There's so many things that we can bring into our system that is healthy for us, but sometimes we get caught up in that negative world of media. And as I say, nudge it, put it into your teaching. You know, I think it's important that we teach students this. There's more and more depression and anxiety among students, and it's probably because the social media and the media that they're taking is really negative. We gotta train these people to realize that the world is a great place, and there's a lot of good people in it. So when I get back to the classroom, I'm most excited about this, is I'm gonna create a positive news wall. I'm gonna create a wall where students come in and celebrate great things that are happening in the community, great things that are happening in the classroom, great things that are happening in the world. So every time we walk into that room, we think the world is good, and we train our brains to realize that because the world is good. We just are not given that from our media somehow. Number four is um, socialize, and we talked about relationships, and I think the most important point I wanna make with this is don't wait for a change in culture. You need to be the change in culture, and that's one thing we have control over. If you don't like the culture in your building, you can control that. You can start doing things that allow you to um, create a better culture and one that you'll enjoy teaching in. See, the blue zones are, when I go back to that, again, they have all these things that they do that nudge them in, and one of them is social integration and how they tie their lives together. And I think we can do this in education as well, right? Um, for instance, in the blue zones, one family will cook a meal 
and for one day, and then they'll, they'll rotate through families and they'll eat together. I read on average they spend six to eight hours a day socializing. Seems a lot, but look at what it's doing for them. They're living happier and healthier for much longer. So, you know, we always have clubs in schools for students, but I love teacher clubs. I love the idea of promoting socialization within our schools. Um, my sister's school has a club where they drink coffee in the mornings, and one teacher will go get the coffees for everybody one morning, and they'll sit together, and they'll socialize, and they'll have some fun with that. And I think, and then the next teacher does it the next day, and I think to myself, that's awesome. So creating clubs around what your interests are for teachers pulls you together. You know, I also like the idea of work dates. You know, if you listen to any marriage person, they'll say, you need to carve out time and have a date night, right? A date nights are so important, right? And my wife tells me that all the time, too. And I think we can do that in education. If there's people that really inspire us, people that make us better, people we love to be around, people we find are fun, we need to carve out time. We need to make time in that schedule. We need to make it a priority and book a time for them during the day or every day or once a week or whatever you, whatever you can work out because it's important to build that into what we do. And I think there's other ways such as co-teach and mentoring. I think these are really fulfilling ways to even get deeper in building those relationships. The next one is signature strengths. And signature strengths is all about, you know, doing what you love to do and bringing it into your job. So what is it you really love? What is it that you feel you're really good at? Because the research says the more time you can execute a signature strength during the day, the more fulfilled you'll be in your job. So go out there and think, what is it? What, what do I have that I really love? And then look at extracurriculars. Look at the content you're delivering to the class. Find ways to bring that in. It will just impact your happiness and make you love your job even more. And the last one is kindness, and kindness is super important. You know, when they look at the happiness research, they have this stat that says the most acute response to happiness, the way you can increase your happiness the most in the moment is by an act of kindness. You know, and I think going back to that, I think we can build this into what we teach. And I think we need to build this into what we teach. I think it's important that we teach students to be kind. And, you know, we do things like volunteering. and We do things like helping other people. And sometimes we get caught up in thinking of all these big things. But let's do the small things. Let's do everyday gestures. Let's do authentic, simple things. You know, the best way to teach kindness is to model kindness. Let them see you being kind. And a byproduct of kindness is happiness. And everyone wins them. So the next one in STRIVE is I, and it stands for Innovate. And Innovate is all about change. And this is something I, I, you know, I've come to realize that this is one of the most important things that we as educators need to do. I'll tell you, I do this activity called the Dotmocracy when I do my happiness workshops. And in the Dotmocracy, what that is, is basically I put out these different aspects of teaching all around the room. And I have, and I give them all like at the beginning 36 red dots and I say, Invest these red dots wherever you want in terms of what brings you the most amount of happiness. And then, they, then we talk about it. And then what I do is I give them a blue dot. And I say, I want you to do the same activity, but this time I want you to, like the red dots for was the most amount of happiness at the beginning of their career. Now I say, I want you to do that what brings you the most amount of happiness now. And we talk about it. And I want to show you, this is out of Sudbury, I did this one. I want to show you some really awesome stats. Making an impact on teachers' lives Every time I've done this is the, is the one that gets the most amount of dots. And it makes me really proud to be in a profession where that's where the people I work with drive, derive the most amount of happiness from. That, that, that page makes me proud every time I see it. This page, however, makes me laugh. Never has one person put a dot on that page. I think it's awesome. But this is the most powerful in terms of innovation. So look at this one, planning great lessons. It gets 63 dots for people at the beginning of their career, and it gets 18 for where they're currently at. I'll tell you a very interesting story about this. So we're talking about this, and I pose this question. I say, why if it brought you a lot of happiness, and why if it's the thing you enjoyed the most, why did you stop doing it? And you know what they say? And they, they, they kind of look at you, and then this one guy goes, oh. And I was like, whoa. They had, I was like, what's going on back there? And I said, you all right? And he says, yeah, I'm just super frustrated. And I was like, do I ask him why? And so I go, okay, why? Why are you frustrated? And he goes, I'm just really mad at myself right now. And I said, why is that? And he goes, well, I've been complaining for the last decade that teaching is like Groundhog Day. And he goes, I just realized that I created that. 
I just, I, I just recalled how much I loved planning these great lessons, and I just stopped. I just become very complacent. I just revolved my education around my binder. And I was like, that's powerful. And the most powerful part of the story is two weeks later, I get an email from him, and he told me he threw out all of his binders, and he was starting from scratch again, and he says, the happiness is back. Because he innovated, because he chose to continually to improve himself. Tony Robbins' biggest quote is, progress is happiness. And nowhere is that more true than education. And I think it's all about listening to your lives. Again, stopping, reflecting, you know, asking yourself, am I happy? And listening to why you're not happy. If you're saying that you're bored or you're saying that you're frustrated or you're saying that you need change, you listen to it, and then you say, well, what am I going to do about it? And that's where you make those adjustments, and you ask yourself, is it getting better or worse? And you work towards better. See, tech conferences um, are a great representation of how to find happiness in education. Because we're here to innovate. And it's not about the innovation of the technology that we use. It's the fact that we're innovating ourselves, which is really important. And I think that's something that people should see. And the other thing I think about tech conferences that are really powerful is the social aspect of these things, right? Like at Connect, you're around all these other passionate, motivated, inspiring educators, hopefully developing your P PLNs or hopefully picking up some new TFFs. But tech conferences are a great place and conferences are a great place because learning's happening and you leave here inspired to innovate your practice. The V in STRIVE stands for versatility, and this is all about the ability to adapt. And this is really important in education because education can be tough. You know, all of us are going to land in valleys. You know, I've done that happiness timeline a ton of times. I've never seen anyone put a straight line, and I've never seen anyone put a line that gradually goes up. I've never seen it. Every single person that does this has valleys. And it's in those valleys you have to decide that you're going to adapt. You have to make changes. You have to somehow see things through a different lens. You have to somehow surround yourself with the right people, build in routines that are going to make it work, bring the passion back in teaching somehow. Because it's really sad, and I don't think there's anything more sad than a teacher who's stuck in a valley and doesn't get out. I think that's really sad. We need to strive to get out of the valley and spend more time on those peaks because that is really where we're going to love to do what it is we do best. You like that? Um, and here I'll give you, so I talked about what really happy teachers do. I'll talk to you about what I think really happy teachers, um, really sad teachers do. It's teachers who really struggle in the profession and spend lots of time in the valleys. They tend to spend a lot of their time fighting the system. So they tend to be constantly engaging in this battle over and over again. And I know I've been guilty of it myself. But no one wins there. No one wins there. You need to learn to adapt. The happy teachers, what they're good at doing is they're good at looking at the situation and figuring out how they make it work. I love this quote, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. The system is the system, and it's going to do what it's going to do. We just need to figure out how to make that valuable and how to bring that into our classroom and make it a powerful experience for students. Toxicity. I think it's really bad, and I think it's something that I've got wound up into like this. And I, you know, when I talk about toxicity, I think it's so important that you learn to just step out of it. It's so important if you see teachers talking bad about kids or staff or administration or education in a whole, you need to just remove yourself from it. The next one is work-life balance. I think this is essential. It goes back to that self-care piece of carving out time and for what's important and having something outside of education that means the world to you and that you're really passionate about and making that a priority. So for me, it's my beautiful family. And you know, it's all about them and it's all about the activities we do together and the fun we have together. And what I've learned is this, if this right here is not going good, then everything else inside of my job is eventually not gonna go well either and vice versa. So make it a priority to have something you really love outside of education and give yourself permission to do that. The last one is E in STRIVE, and it stands for extraordinary. And I know when we think of extraordinary in teachers, we think of those extraordinary teachers that really stand out. I don't want you to think like that right now. I want you to think of it from a different lens. I want you to think of extraordinary like this. I want you to look at it through the lens of a student and what a student would perceive an extraordinary teacher does. 
And I think that's where it's really powerful because I, I guess I'm, I'm going to give you an example that will make it clear. Is um, one of the most extraordinary teachers I know is my sister. And why she's the most extraordinary teacher I know is because she, got, she gets this level of commitment to her students. She's got this level of caring, this level of compassion that she brings to work every day and makes those students feel loved. And she has this ability to create a family in a classroom. And she accepts them as her family, and then they accept her as their family. So much so, as I'll give you a really interesting story, is she teaches grade eight. And one year, those grade eight students, at the end of the year, they go off to high school, and they go to all different high schools. Well, on the first day back in September, they all got together. Every single one, not one didn't show up because they wanted to give my sister a hug and tell them how much she loved them. I think it's really powerful, right? I think that that is what we should be striving for in education, is to be extraordinary for students. And I don't think it's acceptable to settle for mediocrity. I think mediocrity, when you look at the definition in, from the Latin root, it means the middle of a rugged mountain. And when I go back all the way to the beginning and we talk about peaks and valleys, I want you to try and visualize this with me. If you stop striving to be happy or striving to be extraordinary in education, it's like you've made your way up the mountain but never got high enough. You were stuck in the tree line and never could really see the beauty that exists. It's important that we strive to be extraordinary so we can see all of the greatness that education offers us. And I want to end by saying this, is your students deserve extraordinary. Your students deserve to look back and think of Mrs. Keeping was the most extraordinary teacher because she loved me, she cared about me, she changed the direction of my life. It's all about being that extraordinary teacher for your students, but there's more than that. You deserve it. You deserve to be an extraordinary teacher. You deserve to strive for happiness. And the reason why is because I want you to spend as little time in the valley as possible and sit on the peaks or the summits and look out over education and think, this is the greatest. And I hope you guys can do that. So I want to thank you very much for uh, being here today. Uh, if you have time later today, 2 o'clock, we'll be on this stage doing an Ignite. And if you want something really special, Lee Martin over here will be presenting 9 o'clock tomorrow. If you don't have anything in your agendas, you don't want to miss that presentation. Have a great day.